first of all, <coughs> thank you uh, for inviting me here today. Um, as I was, this week's been a, a long week, and I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare what I was going to say. And as I was driving through Harlingen, um, I had this habit of driving to the park because that's where my parents were raised. And uh, as, I, as a child, uh, it's how I learned how to come into Harlingen. But I see now, uh, in, in view of the immigration debate uh, that this country is in the middle of, uh, as I drove through Fair Park, I couldn't help but think uh, about my grandparents uh, on the Sanchez side uh, who came you know, in the early part of the 1900s. Uh, my grandfather uh, watched uh, as his future father-in-law was about to be hung and was part of a group of people that helped rescue him. Uh, and that's when uh, they came to this country uh, where he met uh, my grandmother who was not as Mexico. And uh, eventually became very close to my paternal grandparents, my grandmother, Maria Vizacada Mascu, um, by coincidence, had come through Reynosa with Congressman Hinojosa's uh, father because they were first cousins. And uh, as they made their way in America, my grandfather was a union man. Uh, he worked the railroads. And I clearly remember those mornings waking up in Fair Park windows open right across the street from the railroad and there's railroad tracks coming through and uh, his, his children putting his quarters on the railroad tracks and my grandfather watching on the side. Uh, but you know when you, when you think about what my grandfather and grandparents went through and how they came here and what they were able to achieve by educating these children by uh, one of whom uh, became a federal judge appointed by President Carter, uh, one of whom became the first female uh, mayor of Brownsville. The opportunity uh, that citizenship gave my grandparents is something that every child of the future uh, should have as well. And so there is no difference between the opportunities that I was given because of the hard work uh, that my grandparents who were involved in, uh, made their way in this country and that of the children of the future whose parents are working in our hotels, our restaurants, and construction sites all around this country. I don't have a lot of time um, because the day gave uh, my friends and myself about a few minutes, but I just want to make a few very quick points, and I want to make them very clear. You well know uh, that with respect to immigration reform and border security, that my stance is very clear. The legalization process is about what are we going to do to make it fair for the people that are in this country working on it right And I know we need border security, but when we talk about border security, we're talking about what are we going to do about making sure that we don't have illegal migration in the future, but they're two different things. And uh, we have people in Congress um, who believe that what we ought to do is gather up every undocumented worker in this country and send them back. And we know that's wrong. But we got to give uh, the people that send that message, Steve King, for example, Michelle Hoffman, a little bit of credit because at least they're being honest with the real danger are those that say, we're for immigration reform, but only if we get border security first. The fact of the matter is when they say that, what they're saying is they don't want immigration reform. We need, we, need to, we need to call them out straight. Because, uh, I think moving forward, those two things have to be tested. So, now, we're here to talk about militarization of the border. Um, one of our greatest challenges as members of Congress who represent our districts uh, is that constant messaging about a border crisis uh, and border security and all these things about the border. What this border community 
really is about. It's about the first, uh, it was about to be the second largest Hispanic serving institution in this country. A brand new medical school. Uh, Ford of Brownsville, who's four and Jerusalem <coughs> just yesterday was, uh, was named as uh, the most successful Ford and Trade Zone in the United States for $3.2 billion in trade. Uh, of all the great industries that we have at the Port of Brownsville, and of course, a future space travel that we're about uh, to see launched here at SpaceX. That's what this community is about. It's the idea that there is a border crisis, <coughs> that border security ends or begins at the border, uh, is just false because at the end of the day, what is uh, really the problem, it's two things. One is addressing economic development in Central America, Mexico, and in our region. And we cannot deny the fact that both from the human trafficking and uh, the smuggling of drugs, that <coughs> there are organized institutions uh, that are causing those things. But those are not institutions that begin or <coughs> these are these are these are problems that begin in Central America, in Mexico, but are experienced in a thousand cities across this country. FBI statistics show that there is cartel presence in a thousand cities across this country. Last week, a member of Congress from New Mexico called me and said she's a friend and. Uh, and the reason everything probably not the same. So we're coming with, a, with some members of Congress uh, to come see the kids at the border. I said, go home because uh, if there's more of these kids in your district than there are here. If you want to come to my district, come with me so that I can show you all these other great things. But my final point is uh, what the governor needs to do is send a national guard back. And these private militias <laughs> will have to defeat them since he won't. <laughs> but he needs, to, he needs to let them go back home to treat with their families and go back to their jobs. And what he needs to do is spend money uh, in law enforcement. What he ought to be doing is letting our sheriff's departments and our uh, police chiefs uh, take care of what they're supposed to do. And finally, uh, with respect to the border fence, uh, you know how strongly I believe about that. Uh, but the only thing we should do with the border fence is tear it down. And but again, thank you for your perseverance. I know it's been a long road for many of you, and I wish I could say uh, that we're going to see legislative change soon, but the reality is, given the makeup of Congress, that we're likely not. Although I have great faith in the president, uh, I believe that sometime soon that we're going to see executive action, uh, which is going to uh, give people who have been working around this country the fairness that they deserve by giving them a chance uh, to work here legally. And most importantly, an opportunity for families that have been disconnected to be reunited. One of the uh, great pleasures that I have in Congress is to be able uh, to share the experience of the border with other members. And uh, I want to introduce them, a few of them to be here with me. But before I do that, I do want to acknowledge we have two, um, they're not members of Congress yet, hopefully they'll be joining us soon. Um, in the Democratic Caucus, we call them a great group these are, these are candidates uh, that we support. Uh, they, they live in districts that are currently held by uh, Republicans, um, but are the Democratic nominees uh, in those respective districts. This is a man that I've been from.
and I don't want to misspeak because California is such a large state. Uh, central, so fair to say Central is California for about. Uh, but thank you for being down here. And next, I'm going to let uh, a few of my colleagues say a few words to you. Uh, Congressman Frank Pallone is from New Jersey. Uh, the, believe it or not, the leadership in the Democratic Party uh, in Washington is not all that democratic because seniority plays a large role. <laughs> and I promised him, uh, he already he, he scolded me last night. What's worse is he scolded Congressman Nahusa tell you something, because uh, he didn't want us to say how long he had been in Congress. Uh, but uh, Congressman Pallone is a, he is the leading Democrat on the Health Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce, and poised to be the uh, Democratic leader of the Energy and Commerce Committee. He's joining us today from uh, the New Jersey shores. And Congressman Tony Godness, sorry, please. Um, Congressman Cousins uh, came into Congress at the same time, same time I did. He is a passionate advocate uh, for immigration reform, and it is my <coughs> pleasure to introduce them to you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for inviting me. I obviously would like to hear from the panel, but I'll just say this. Um, when I walked in, um, and maybe naive, being naive, Jersey. Uh, I haven't looked at the immigration reform debate from the militarization point of view, I guess because uh, when people are in my district, New Jersey, they've obviously already come across the border and, you know, successfully are here, even if they're undocumented. So I really haven't thought much about militarization and the fact that people have shot or killed. So this was, this was worthwhile to learn that um, and, you know, what you're going to say about that. Uh, just being here to hear that was certainly worthwhile to me because it's not something that, that, that we talk about in New Jersey when we talk about immigration or the whole militarization so much. Um, but I wanted to say that um, it's still a, a major issue, obviously, all over the country, including in New Jersey. I'm a big advocate of immigration reform. I'm a, uh, a comprehensive reform. I'm on the chair's bill. And Senator Menendez is, uh, is the sponsor of the Senate of the same bill. Uh, is, is obviously my senator from New Jersey. Um, but in New Jersey, um, you know, it's not just, it's certainly not a Mexican issue, it's not even a necessarily a Hispanic issue because we have large groups of um, people who are undocumented from the Indian community, you know, from, the, uh, from Asia. I have more Indian Americans than any other congressmen. We have a lot of Irish uh, who are here uh, in New Jersey who are undocumented. So we don't even see it necessarily as a Hispanic issue. I mean, this is something that needs to be done uh, in general. And uh, it, 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 you, know, you can look at it from all different points of view, but one of the big things <coughs> is uh, when kids go to college, if they're eligible for scholarships, if they go to college, um, the health care issue, because I was a big advocate for the Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, but as you know, those who are undocumented were not included. Uh, in Obamacare. So there's so many aspects uh, that uh, play into this. Um, and that is that, you know, uh, the reason why we need comprehensive immigration reform, not only to make, to make it so people have a better way to citizenship, but to deal with all these other aspects um, as well. And the last thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, Phil didn't mention it, but I'm in charge of the message for the House Democrats. And the thing that bothers me the most, and maybe, maybe we can hear a little about that today, is that when I talk to people, even people who I would consider incredibly racist, uh, or you know, who, who uh, you know, wouldn't even want to talk to somebody who's undocumented, most of them still feel strongly that we need comprehensive immigration reform. The usual response is, "Well, I just wish people would pay taxes and learn English," you know. And I'll say to them, "Well, that's the whole point." If you look at the bill that we're sponsoring, it says you do have to learn English, you do have to pay your taxes, you have to register, you have to pay a fine. And so I think that the public is way ahead of us. You know, the public understands that we need comprehensive immigration reform and overwhelmingly supports what we would do with that legislation. But somehow we're just not getting the message out, you know, through the media or influencing Republicans that might be willing to go along with us. And, and 
and it really frustrates me that I, I do believe that you know, what you're advocating is what 80 or 90 percent of Americans would like to see, and yet we're not able to effectuate it in Washington. So, you know, one of the things I like to hear is you know, how we can influence public opinion or the media or our colleagues who are not necessarily with us to change their mind and be supportive of the conference.
however, if you have an emergency. And we will go ahead and just get started with our panel. Um, Dr. Jessica Lavariega Monforti is with the University of Texas Pan American. She specializes in Latino politics and policy. Scott Nicole is with the Sierra Club, the Borderlands team. Um, Dr. Perryman with the Perryman Group is an excellent economist that did a study specifically on the cost of the National Guard deployment. And we have Astrid and Maria with the ACLU and the RGB Equal Voice Network, and they will be talking about human and civil rights violations. So if you would like to get started. Buenos dias. Primero me gustaría decir que yo no nací en el Valle, pero siento que soy del Valle ahorita. Um, voy a dar mi, mi plática en inglés, pero si hay alguna pregunta después, por favor, que me, me pregunten en español si se siente a gusto. First, I would like to say, uh, for those who are not Spanish speaking, I said uh, I'm not born in the Valley, but I feel like I'm from the Valley. I've been here for about 10 years. Um, and so, um, I'm coming from that perspective of what changes I have seen uh, as a resident and as a scholar in this area in terms of militarization of the border over the last decade. So I really want to talk about first, uh, I mean, I'm a political scientist, so I sort of have to start with the question of what is a border and what does it mean to say that it's becoming militarized. Um, a border really just means that it's a line, a line in the sand somewhere that at least two people have agreed on. But what happens on that border really is about the decisions that we make uh, as a government and as a society, the agreements that we have and the disagreements we have over that line in the sand. And so it's really what we create as, who, as humans that define that border. And so we can see that different borders look different, feel different uh, for those of you who have perhaps traveled. And our border has certainly changed. The agreements about what is acceptable on our border have changed over time. In terms of militarization, what we want to talk about here is the aggregation of military force in a particular territory. Um, it means more than just personnel, boots on the ground. Certainly, we have seen an increase um, in boots on the ground. Uh, but it's also about how what our border looks like has changed, as I have this really great image from Scott right above me, right? Um, it's about checkpoints, uh, the physical ones, but also the ones that come to our mind every time we leave our house, right? Um, so it's about the psychology <coughs> as much as it is about the geography of the space that we're talking about. What we have seen over the last 30 years is a pretty persistent push uh, to militarize our border. Uh, it used to be, for those of you who have lived in this area for a really long time, quite easy to cross back and forth between Mexico, right? As I talk to my students at UTPA, I hear lots of stories about how people would just be asleep in a car with family members and just cross and no one asked for any documents and it didn't matter, right? Because we were all going home the next day anyway or we were going to visit at the Tio. Um, and, it was, and it was okay. And now what we have seen is an increase in sort of the stress around our border. Okay. Um, we have seen an effort on the part of the US government to contain this space. And what oftentimes is not really being thought of is what is the impact for the residents of this area? There's lots of conversation from people who have never visited our border, from people who have never really thought very much about what it means to live in this area about safety and security. Um, and very little conversation about what it means all of a sudden to live within a 100 mile area of the border. So we have a border wall. The very first piece of that comes in in 1994 out in um, California. And again, it was an effort to push those who were trying to come into the United States without going through a checkpoint into certain areas. Um, and the idea, of course, at that time was that people would realize what the dangers were um, in terms of crossing into a desert, forcing people into this funnel, and they would decide not to come. Uh, but it was a massive underestimation of the issues that people were facing in their homelands. 
they forgot the risk that people are willing to take to improve their life situation, to improve survival of their families. Um, and we have seen an, a huge increase in the number of deaths of those people attempting to cross. So in 1994, there were 14 deaths on the border. And in 2010, uh, there were 253 human remains found in Arizona alone. Okay. Since 1994, there have been over 6,000 remains found in the desert. And many more who will never be found, who will never be identified. Um, and this is not a deterrent. This should tell us how strong the factors are that push people to make the decision to try to make this journey. We have an organization, uh, Border Patrol, that's been around since 1924. Their job uh, has changed over time. Uh, what we now have is the Department of Homeland Security with a Customs and Border Protection Agency, which now has about 21,000 members, agents. Um, this is up from just having 8,500 agents in 2001. So the vast majority of the growth of the boots we see on the ground has happened in the post 9-11 era. I have to say I'm a native New Yorker. So what happened on 9-11 uh, certainly impacted me. There were family members of mine who we could not find on that day. Most of the men in my family are FDNY or NYPD. Uh, and so I don't say that to make light of it, uh, but we have to really think about how border security and how putting more boots on the ground would have potentially changed that situation versus sort of weighing that against what the impact has been for people here. According to their website, the priority mission is preventing terrorists and terrorist weapons, including weapons of mass destruction, uh, from entering the United States. How does a buildup on our southern border help us reach that mission? On how many occasions have we caught terrorists, weapons of mass destruction, coming in through our southern border? I sort of leave that out there for a moment. Uh, because, of course, there have been none of those reports. A primary mission, as opposed to the priority mission of the Border Patrol, is to detect and prevent the illegal entry of aliens into the country. Are we doing that? Are putting more boots on the ground, more weapons on the ground, drones in the air, helping us with this mission? And according to the Border Patrol's own numbers, we were doing a better job in terms of apprehensions in the 90s before we had all of these additional boots on the ground and all of these weapons and the drones that we see in the airs today. Eighty-seven percent of the 21,000 agents of the Border Patrol are on our southwest border. 87%. And again, I ask the question, what is the threat that has been shown on the Southwest border other than people looking for work, right? So what are the consequences of that? I've been asked kind of to talk today about what is, what is the impact for people here, but I thought it was important to kind of give that overview. Um, here's what we have seen, the impact of this buildup on our border. From January 2010 to June 2013, at least 15 Mexican citizens have been killed by U.S. Border Patrol agents shooting into Mexico, which is a sovereign country, right? We're shooting into someone else's country and killing their citizens. So this is not someone who's on U.S. soil who's broken a law, okay? We have seen uh, Customs and Border Protection purchase over 36 million rounds of ammunition in 2012 alone. What war are we preparing for that we need that many bullets? Agents have opened fire on rock throwers 22 times in three years. Okay. In 2010, President Obama signed Southwest Border Security Bill. And what this includes is the deployment of predator pilotless drones, like the ones used in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, Pakistan, um, to conduct surveillance on the border. 
It also included pay for hiring a thousand more border patrol agents to be deployed along our border. And the government also hired 250 new customs and border patrol officers and 250 ICE personnel. The legislation allocates 32 million for the deployment of additional drones. And additional money is going to set up military style bases in the border area and to assist local police agencies. According to Ralph Hinojosa, who is a, pro a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, to catch, he says, to catch a Mexican, um, it now costs US taxpayers um, $8,000 in 2013, whereas in 1992, it cost $220 per capture. So we're spending more, and yet we don't feel any safer, okay? We are now spending more, 24% more, just on immigration and border enforcement than we are with the, for the FBI, the Secret Service, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Marshal Service, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Fire, Firearms, and Explosives taken together. Taken together. What does this mean? Okay. On the one hand, it means jobs, in many cases, for local residents. Who are all these thousand people who are going to be hired to fill these Border Patrol positions? Many of them will be local residents. So it does mean jobs. And potentially good paying ones, ones with federal benefits, right? But Josiah Heyman, uh, an anthropologist, wrote that the Southwest border was becoming a militarized border society where more and more people either work for the watchers or are watched by the state. What is the trade-off here that we are giving people jobs, but what does that do to the psychology of a person who is now policing their own communities? In many ways, we're dealing with issues of social control. Where can you go? Where is it safe to go? Where will there be a DPS checkpoint just pop up? Are we safe to send our children to school? Are media reports about a crisis on the border reflective of the reality that we see on the ground? <coughs> All of these kinds of things create a scenario where we're really <coughs> unsure about our safety. Despite the fact that FBI figures are showing that the border area is relatively safe. And actually, crime has not increased. Reports of crime have increased, but actual crime has not increased on the border. So we have seen, as a result of increased boots on the ground, <coughs> increased militarization, more bullets, more drones, a really very serious issue. Border Patrol agents record the skin complexion of the people they arrest. And most of those arrested were of medium skin complexion from Latin America, according to a 2011 report. So how do we decide who is us and who is them? Who do we decide who's suspect? Well, according to these statistics, they're telling us who the suspects are. They're people who are medium complexion from Latin America. Well, that makes almost everyone in this room a suspect. What we have also seen is thousands of complaints being poured into compliance offices dealing with these issues. What rights do we have if we are stopped by Border Patrol? What questions can they ask you? <coughs> what are the limitations of their power? People are really unsure about the answers to those questions. So we did a survey called Pulse of the Valley, or Pulse of the Valley, and we asked people if they feel safer today than they did five years ago. Despite the fact that crime rates have not increased in this five-year period, what we have is um, one in four residents indicating that they feel safer living in the U.S.-Mexico border area today than they did five years ago, while almost 60% disagreed or strongly disagreed with that statement. 
In other words, we're being convinced by politicians who don't live here, by national media conversations, by people who really aren't coming here to find out what's happening on the ground, that we are not safe. We also ask people if the border security measures that have been employed uh, have been successful in dealing with the issues that people who live here think are most important. And only about 14% of the respondents we talked to said that they've been very successful. 46% said somewhat successful, 16% said somewhat unsuccessful, and 20% said very unsuccessful. So for the things that we care about most as residents of this area, about a third of us think that it has not been successful. We also asked about the impact of the border wall on people's lives. Does it make us feel any safer or not? And actually 13% said they feel safer. 11% said the wall makes them feel less safe. And about 57% said, uh, sorry, 40, uh, 73% indicated that the construction of the border wall has had no impact on their feeling of safety at all. That's a really big price tag for this wall to have no impact on the vast majority of people who are supposedly going to be impacted by whatever unsafe thing is going to happen. We also asked about what experiences have been like for people at checkpoints. Specifically, we asked about the permanent checkpoints like the one in Fogfordias. And 57% of the residents that we spoke to uh, said that they had been stopped at a border checkpoint. If you talk to someone who lives in the middle of Iowa, if you talk to someone who lives in New York, my home state, and you ask them, have you been stopped at a checkpoint? Their answer is going to be, what are you talking about? What is a checkpoint? We have job candidates from all over the country who come down to the valley to interview for jobs at UDPA, and we have to warn them that as they fly out to go home, they may be asked about their citizenship status, despite the fact that you're only supposed to have that question asked to you if you're traveling internationally, right? But we have a checkpoint almost everywhere we go if you try to leave this area. To us, this is normal part of life. But to the country as a whole, it is not. Something is out, is something is disjointed here about that. 50% said that their experiences when they were stopped were positive. That's good news. About half of the people who were stopped said they had a positive interaction. About 33% said it was neutral. They were asking questions, sort of let go. But almost 13% said that they had a negative experience. So that's, that's significant, okay? So the question that we have to ask is, how do we balance the needs of the country to be safe, to police its borders, <coughs> at the same time that we preserve um, due process rights and the sense that we still live in a democracy where people can have a say in what happens in their lives of the residents who live here locally? There was a really great story about um, a gentleman who lives in La Jolla in, the, in a newspaper, I think it was in the Chronicle, who talked about the fact that he lives on the border, his land, his property uh, is very close to the border. Um, he is a Mexican immigrant himself. Uh, he is armed on his own property, but he fights both the Border Patrol and potential thieves, as he calls them, coming across the border. Should that be the case? That if you are a resident here, you're not sure who you need to protect yourself against most. Right now, more than 375,000 immigration cases are pending across the country. The average wait time to have a hearing is over 570 days. In Texas, the average backlog is over 400 days. How can we reconcile this situation? It seems like adding more border patrol, uh, increasing border security, the buildup of arms, addition of checkpoints, has not solved any of the root causes of the problems that we face. 
how do we change the discussion to include a conversation about sending money uh, for social programs to the country sending us folks rather than military funds mm -hmm. to fight narcotraficantes. So three takeaways. One, our border is expanding. In other words, the reach of border patrol is expanding beyond just the immediate border area. We really are seeing a confusion between the primary and priority missions of border patrol, which puts us all at risk for violations of due process. And our space is segregated. Unless you've got a shirt on that says whether you're here legally or not, if you're medium brown skin from Latin America or with roots from Latin America, apparently you're a suspect. I'm sure we'll hear more, uh, Mr. Perryman, I know you're gonna talk about the economic impact of this, uh, but in California alone, undocumented immigrants have uh, contributed over $130 billion to the GDP. Undocumented immigrants are an engine for economic growth. So why are we spending all of these funds all of this effort um, that what we see is basically hurting people, hurting growth of areas, um, and hurting our economy. Thank you. What a perfect segue, Dr. Perryman. <laughs> I'll set it up for you. Can, sure. I have to move my hands and walk when I talk. I won't try to chew up, but I am going to walk and talk. Okay. <laughs> it's great to be here. I always enjoy the, the chance I get to come down to this area. I love this area. I uh, never had the privilege of living here. I was uh, raised in East Texas in a small town and educated in Waco and West Texas and worked at Baylor and lived in Waco for a long time. My office is still there. I live in Odessa now. You want to know why I live in Odessa? My office is in Waco. It's because 22 years ago I married the mayor of Odessa. <laughs> <laughs> Very small town in East Texas. Uh, in fact, it was so small we had to take driver's education, sex education, the same car. <laughs> <laughs> well, I explained that to my wife. She said, that makes sense. You don't drive very well either. It's great to be here. And I always love it when I get to come down here. I usually get to come down late two or three times a year. It's always a pleasure. I love the place. I love the people. And uh, <clears throat> when I got the email from Amber, <clears throat> I almost didn't say yes. Because I had been in Chicago yesterday and on the road all next week. My daughter's getting ready to the house in about a month and there's chaos there. I was like, man, I just don't want to take another day. And I was in Chicago and I had to fly on a long flight. And then I, then I just thought about it. Well, it was probably a couple of days before I gave you an answer. What? Yes. And it, you were talking about secretary back and forth and all this was going on. The stuff that happened, somebody tried to get me to do something. And finally, I just, I, I just said, you know, I have to go. This is too important. So I decided I would come down here and, and, and visit. Uh, I have, as a lot of you know, and I was talking earlier, I have been in the um, business of looking at immigration and undocumented workers for a long time, a lot of other issues. And when I look at something, I obviously have personal opinion if I can all do it. But, I, <clears throat> but when I give public opinions, I'm looking through the wind and the hunts. And I talk about my background, which is quantitative economic modeling and that sort of thing. I'm not going to pull any equations right now. But about five or six years ago, we did a study, a 50 state study. In fact, your California number may have come from that, and a couple others, I don't know. Uh, just to go that. Looking at the economic impact by state of undocumented workers. And it's huge, it's enormous. If you took them away, it'd be a very weak economy. I'm going to do some real simple math for you right now about Texas, just to give you a perspective on how silly it is that we don't have comprehensive, reasonable There There's roughly 12 million people working in Texas right now, or in the workforce in Texas. Okay, so be. The unemployment rate is about 5%. I think it's 5.2. That's close enough for the math I'm going to do. That means there are about 600,000 unemployed people in Texas. More than 400,000. About 600,000. Best we can tell, the data is tough data to get because people don't keep that. Undocumented means not documented. <laughs> so people keep a little happy with that on this. But the Pew Hispanic Center and a number of others have done some very good research over the years. Best we can tell, there's about 1.1 million undocumented immigrants 
working in Texas today. Now let's think about that. Because the Army Colleges are taking American jobs. You've got to stop them to take American jobs. Well, we have 600,000 people not working in Texas. We have 1.1 million undocumented people working in Texas. Okay? So obviously, if each one of those unemployed people could do one of those jobs, and that's silly in that city, because most of them don't have a physical stamina to do the agricultural work. They don't have the skill to do the construction work. And the other things go up that, that, that a lot of them are not going to do when you have to concentrate. Uh, they're not in the right regions to do the hospitality work. Either. For a lot of reasons, it wouldn't work. But let's just pretend for a minute it wouldn't work. Okay? And, and every just taking those jobs for parents. Okay? And so we take those 600,000 people and we give them all one of those jobs. We still need a half a million of those undocumented workers. It's just mad. It shouldn't be politics. And unfortunately, it becomes way too good. But it's, but it's just mad. And I stop and think, you know, we talk all the time there about the Texas miracle the great growth we've had, and I've been proven to be a part of some of the legislation that made that happen, and, 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 and be a model on projects that made it happen. I'm very pleased about that. But let's think about the Texas economy without a not Our agricultural sector would collapse. Our construction sector would collapse. Our hospitality sector would collapse. So we would have an economy where you couldn't grow anything, go anywhere, or build anything. That wouldn't be much of a cut. I don't think anybody call that miracle. That may be. It's not the kind of miracle we hope to have. So all that to say, that's all just, just it's just common sense. I mean, I, I'm really good to say we can't get politicized. And an example of something being politicized right now is this recent story. I think I haven't heard anyone credibly say it's helping. Because the enforcement authority is not right. It's you need more people that are not the right kind of people, the right kind of authority to do anything. It, it, it's very much a political thing. And, and, and I mean, if you know, the governor's very good friend of mine. His wife worked with me for three years. Our families are traveling together. I, uh, but, but I call him like a city. When he comes again, I put my comments in, don't call him like a city. But in any case, uh, the, uh, so Amber asked me to come in and talk about this. And so, and, and again, I'm going to talk to the men of these numbers. Jessica gave you a lot of perspective on people and the reality of what people think, how it impacts people. That gets translated into these numbers. Scott's going to talk about some of the environmental consequences of these things. Um, uh, I'm sure Maria is going to talk about some, some of the, the, the ways that affect real people on a daily basis. But I get the privilege of coming in here and talking about it and leaving. You have to live it every day. You're going to boost roll the ground and really try to, to generate the grassroots effort to get some meaningful solutions here. And so when I started thinking about it, I said, well, okay, I'll come back and talk about it. Well, then I get to think, well, I'm going to talk about it. I need numbers. So we decided to do a little study and come up with some numbers, which I, I don't know if y'all have copies of it. It's posted on a website somewhere. I don't know how. It's on a website. Send it out. Send it out. Okay. They don't have copies, but. Yeah, we're going to see Okay, okay. So you have, she's holding the pants on the one. I just signed the card. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, so you have access to it. Uh, in some form or fashion, I assume you did. And here's what we did. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this was a, when I first started saying, how in the world am I going to measure the effects on the economy of doing this? And I always kind of, I tell people when I start a project, I start with blank sheet of paper and kind of figure out what is I know and I don't know what I need to try to find out. And it turned out to be a whole lot easier than I thought it would be. Unfortunately, because there's been other deployments. And so I could look at how the economy performed during those deployments. And adjust for all the things you can adjust for. Because how the U.S. economy is doing at that time makes a difference. How much trade is going on, how it affects ports makes a difference. What the exchange rate is, how it affects trade and sales in Mexico makes a difference. So hope, all those things I can adjust for once I have periods of time, it's almost like a laboratory control experience. At two other periods. And I know it was shocking to find out that going to all these things you control for everything, this area does better when we don't have a point going on. And so what we did was measure. Say, okay, right now, today's economy where it is, the exchange rate where it is, the national economy where it is, the trade where it is, everything going on. What's the number that? And models don't give perfect answers, but we've been using these 30 years, and they're not too bad. Uh, and what we found was if a deployment the last two years in today's economy down here in the valley would mean about a half a billion dollars in gross product in this area, the production in this area, and almost 8,000 jobs. 
the impact on Texas is a little bit bigger because there's some spillover effects. So you can over close to buy, buy merchandise or have suppliers or have contractors and vendors from other parts of the state. So the numbers are a little bit larger Texas it goes up to about 650 million dollars in gross products and about to almost 9,000 jobs. Those are big numbers. Roughly two and a half percent of the local economy. Now you've been growing a lot lately. Things have been, the, the, the economy's done reasonably well in recent years here. The employment base has been lower than it's been a long time, although it's still higher than it's been a lot of places. But, uh, but you've been doing fairly well here. You've been growing at about four percent right That's pretty good. If you bump off two and a half percent, you bump off a big chunk of that. You, you bump off a big chunk of that. So the bottom line is, for I come from, again, every perspective is important because it's a big, complex issue. It's not just me, I'm just using my and how I look at it. And, uh, and from where I sit, there are huge implications, personally, that you may hear about. The border wall and the environmental implications that you may hear about. All of these things play into what it means in the economy. The attitudes about it, the, the, the action, and it's just common sense. If people feel a military presence, they're not they just throw the resources. They're not it's, 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 it's more difficult to cross the border. It's more difficult to cross the border. Big chunks of these economies, people cross the border spend money. Big chunks of these economies. And when that becomes a more difficult process, a more risky process, uh, a more scary process, people do less of it. And not surprisingly, a lot of people that come off uh, on the retail side, on personal services, and kind of things, people every day in their lives pay money. That's, that's what it's like to get was. So all that to say, this is a very real economic issue. It has very real consequences. I appreciate what you're doing on the ground to try to work towards the means of solutions. It's a complex issue. We need safe borders. We need safe We need public safety. We need, safety. Uh, we need human compassion. There's some of the folks who, who are here who are in very, very bad situations right now. And the thought of going back to the came from pretty darn scary. Uh, we need them. We need all those things. But there's also very real thoughts and sense numbers in there, too. And that's one of many factors that need, that need to be taken into account. Again, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate your presentation coming down here. It's always a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much. My name is Scott Nichol, and I work for the Sierra Club. I co-chair the Sierra Club's Borderlands team. Um, we got members here, but also in uh, Arizona, Tucson, California, Tijuana. Um, and a lot of our focus is on the environmental impacts of border militarization and border walls in particular. And I have to walk around because I don't have a remote for this thing. And I think that to really have any understanding of this stuff, it helps quite a bit to see it. Um, this is the border wall, not here, because we're kind of mountain deficient here. Um, but in California, this is in the Otan Mountain Wilderness area, which is near San Diego. It's 10 or 12 miles, something like that, from the Pacific. Uh, in California, their wall actually goes into the water, so they have what they call the surf fence. And the border wall, they spend a huge amount of money to engineer this, it plunges into the sea, uh, which you can surfboard around, but you know that's still there. Uh, and so because these walls are up, when we talk about the cost of border militarization, it's not a hypothetical. You know, it's real, we've seen it, we're seeing it, it's ongoing right now. Uh, and so we can look at direct costs, we can look at environmental impacts. Um, but I think it is important, kind of as our last two panelists have said, to be aware that this is not how it has always been. That, you know, if you look at the, the militarization of the border, the economic costs alone have been skyrocketing over the past couple of decades. Um, so, you know, look, if you look at the buildup from 1990 to 1996, the Border Patrol's annual budget doubled. Uh, by the year 2000, it had doubled again, uh, topping a billion dollars for the first time. In 2006, it broke two billion. In 2011, it hit three and a half billion dollars. In that period of time, the number of Border Patrol agents went from 4,000 to 21,000. So, you know, people seemed to feel okay with the world. People weren't um, dying in droves because of an unprotected border in 1990. 
roughly the same as now, except we've got a whole lot of walls. We have currently 652 miles of uh, border walls of one variety or another from California to here. That's 652 miles across 1,900 miles of border. Uh, got nothing on the Canadian border, even though that's twice as long. And we spent $3 billion on that and counting. So the question then becomes, how do we deal with this? Uh, and do we keep doing it? Because I think one, of the, one thing to keep in mind is that there are members of Congress who want more of this stuff. Uh, you, can, you get many proposals to build more walls, to uh, hire more border patrol, to get more drones. And so this isn't sort of past history. You know, This is something that is liable to get worse unless we do something to stop that from happening. Now, this is one of our walls. Uh, this is Hidalgo County's levee wall version where they basically tore off a third of the levee, put in a concrete slab, uh, put posts on top of it. So this is in Hidalgo, Texas. Uh, and it's also in the lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge. <clears throat> when walls went up, they often went up in wildlife refuges. Uh, they, especially down here, um, they were seen as low-hanging fruit. And that was actually a quote from the Border Patrol on numerous occasions because they were having a lot of trouble condemning people's property. Uh, not that they lost those condemnation suits, just that they took time. And so to speed things up, they took lands that were already federally owned. Those lands, of course, uh, tended to be U.S. Fish and Wildlife refuges. Uh, and so you get walls like this through habitat that's supposed to be set aside for federally endangered species. Uh, in this case, the, the ocelot. Now, the concrete part of that is 18 feet, and then you got you know, roughly that much more on top of it. An ocelot can't build a ladder. They can't make it over that. To make that happen, um, to make that construction happen, Congress gave the Department of Homeland Security, and in particular, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the power to waive any law on the books to speed up construction of walls and build roads, patrol roads, alongside those walls. So under the Bush administration, uh, former Secretary Chertoff waived 36 laws to build these. And these were mostly environmental laws, but not entirely environmental laws. So Endangered Species Act doesn't matter anymore. But also, Farmland Policy Protection Act, doesn't matter anymore. Uh, Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, doesn't matter anymore. Safe Drinking Water Act, doesn't matter anymore. These laws not only protected our environment, they protected us. I like safe drinking water. My water comes from the other side of the border wall. So if their activities pollute the drinking water, I and you don't have any uh, means of stopping that because these laws mean nothing to, to Homeland Security anymore. This is another problem uh, coming up as well because there are a number of proposals that get brought up every year to expand this. Right now, these waivers only apply to walls and roads. There are all kinds of proposals that have come down from, from members of Congress to expand that to cover anything the Border Patrol can dream up within 100 miles of the border instead of right now. Although right now, the border itself is sort of loosely defined. Now this is what, down here, um, <coughs> the refuges were meant to protect. This is uh, trip camera shots of a federally listed endangered species. It's the ocelot. Um, you've seen a bobcat. It's kind of smaller than a bobcat and bigger than a house cat. And <clears throat> they're beautiful cats. There's less than 100 of them left in the United States. This one, these pictures were taken in the lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge. They had a little motion sensitive camera that was triggered by it. They have a bunch of these pictures. They've got some cats that have been radio collared, so they know they're there. But they require habitat. You know, the, the reason that they are federally endangered, they used to be all over the place, you know. Back in the day before Harlingen existed, there would have been ocelots walking through here. But 
you know, the, the habitat has been fragmented. You know, you've got highways, you've got um, buildings, you've got farms, you've got all this stuff that eats up their habitat. So the refuge is meant to connect habitat, mostly using the Rio Grande. So if you look at a map, and I've got one at the very end that'll have, uh, kind of show where that, those refuge tracks are, they're strung along the Rio Grande. <clears throat> you put border walls through the refuges, and the ocelot comes up on that wall, and it can't get there. <coughs> and so it can't get enough habitat, it can't get enough food, it can't find a mate that it's not already related to. And you have dwindling populations. So that the ocelot populations in the United States have been going down and down and down and down and down. Um, this would have been illegal previously, but Department of Homeland Security gets to wave laws. You know, too bad for the ocelot. And of course, too bad for the other endangered species that are all along the border. Same thing in Arizona with the Sonoran pronghorn, with the jaguar. Uh, there are a number of endangered species whose habitat has been sort of sliced and diced by border walls all along the U.S.-Mexico border. This is back to Hidalgo again. Um, <clears throat> you know, getting to Mr. Perryman's uh, in, in economic uh, impact, ecotourism is kind of a big deal here. You know, we get all these winter Texans that come down, we get people that come down from all over the world uh, to see our environment. They would love to see an ocelot, that's kind of tricky because there just aren't very many of them, they're very kind of hard to spot, uh, but they do come down for birds. And so, you know, all along the border, you have what are called the World Birding Centers. That's where you have uh, local groups, municipalities, and the state that protects parks and wildlife uh, working together to create a place where birders will come and, of course, spend their money. You gotta, you know, if they're coming from out of town, they're going to stay in a hotel, they're going to eat at a restaurant. And so, in this area, which compared to much of the rest of the country, uh, has a pretty low per capita income, that money is important. But when you get something like this, this is at the Old Hidalgo Pump House World Birding Center looking towards the Lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge. That World Birding Center was built with the idea that you would just walk up and over the levee and into the forest and look at the birds. And then you keep walking and there's some settling ponds and you can look at the ducks. It's perfect for birds. It's a way to bring uh, ecotourist dollars into Hidalgo. Except you now have the border wall on the way. Uh, and there's a gate there, which is what the pedestrian walking trail sign is supposed to be telling you to go through. And that gate wasn't cheap. <laughs> there are 42 of these gates that have been built in the Rio Grande Valley and the, and the wall, the idea being to allow access to their side. Um, you get them where there's somebody's farm field that's split by the wall, you get them in situations like this. Um, the total cost of those 42 gates was $10.57 million. That averages out to $251,666. Most of them are broken. Um, if you find one, it will be open or it will be closed, but you will not see it open or closed. This one has been shut since January. I've seen work crews out there repeatedly. It hasn't opened since January. Uh, it was built in December. So, you know, didn't get a good warranty on that. But if you are, say, a birder coming in here in the winter and you want to see, or spring, actually spring and fall is better, you want to see the birds, you go to the dog pump house thinking you can walk across, you got a work wall instead. It's not good for business. And neither is this. Um, this is what you're more likely to see if you get on the other side of the wall. I went in April with a friend of mine who is a professional nature photographer and my seven-year-old daughter. And we went into one of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge tracks and <clears throat> came down the dirt road, came upon Border Patrol. He saw the little blonde seven-year-old in her car seat in the back, he called for backup. We ended up boxed in with, notice the machine gun that guy's holding, so was the guy in front. <clears throat> we had five agents hold us there for a half an hour because we were such a threat. They apparently didn't have anything else to do, we didn't see any other activity, they didn't get any other calls, um, they just stood around and took pictures of us for a half an hour. 
This is not good for us living here, obviously. Uh, this is also not good for tourism. You know, if you have a bunch of bird watchers that go into a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge like this one, and they get <coughs> stopped by Border Patrol with machine guns, they are not going to go back home and tell their friends what a great time they had. They are not going to encourage other people to come out here and look at the birds. This scares people. This is bad. It scared the crap out of my daughter. Um, so it's not the kind of thing that we want to have. Another big kind of combined environmental and social problem that we get with the border wall is flooding. Border walls are built basically along a straight line. And that straight line doesn't care if there's a wash crossing it. And so, especially in Arizona, you get all these places where water used to flow north, south, or south, north, and a wall is splitting it in two. Um, <clears throat> this is an event in 2008. Basically, in Arizona, southern Arizona, every summer they have what's called the monsoons. You have water that comes off the Pacific, comes off the Sea of Cortez, giving thunderstorms. And so you get kind of torrential, short lived downpours. They hit the wash, it washes away, and it's gone. You kind of know that. It's expected. It's been that way since forever. That didn't make much difference to the people building the walls there. This is Nogales, Arizona on the left, Nogales, Sonora on the right. You have a big thunderstorm event, the same kind of thing you have all the time. <clears throat> the wall's acting as a dam here. If you look on the right, you can see the eaves on those buildings. You know, figure there's a six foot door or, or seven foot door underneath that eave. The water's almost to the top of it. You look on the left, kind of on the left side of the picture, there's a guy walking. His, the water's about ankle deep for him. Two people die. The, this is after most of the water drained out on the right side. All the cars, that's, that picture, I think that's the same building in the background as, as in the left. Uh, that's kind of getting up against the hill there. You know, they had enough of a flood to wash these cars into the border wall. You had millions of dollars of damage. Two people died in Mexico. <coughs> this is what happens when you stick a wall into a wash or a river. Um, so, this is why that kind of thing happens elsewhere. The same thing happened in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in that same uh, flood event. There, debris washed into a wall. This is not an organ pipe, but same basic structure. Um, debris washes into a wall. You know, the wall is permeable at first. You put a bunch of junk in it, it blocks up, it becomes a dam. So this left picture was taken a year before that big flood in Nogales. It's a Bureau of Land Management photograph. So they know what's coming. They know that this happens to their walls. The ones on the right, were taken by Coast and Border Protection. Um, now, CBP has been going around and saying, oh, no, no, if we build walls and washes, it's all cool. You got these big grates there. The water can go right through it. But those two pictures on the right, those are Customs and Border Protection's pictures. They were shown in McAllen in 2009 in a slideshow that was presented to contractors who were supposed to take care of the border walls, who were supposed to pick this junk out of the walls to keep it from blocking like that. So they know this stuff happens. Now, after the 2008 flood, they uh, retrofitted a bunch of walls in Arizona. They put these floodgates in that were supposed to let the water through. Uh, and then right after they finished that, the walls dammed up again and a 40 foot section blew out. So they went back and fixed that, of course, uh, retrofitted it some more. And by retrofit, I'm talking like everything basically from El Paso to California got retrofits. Uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So this is 2010. Uh, this is in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. Last month, they had another 60 foot section blow out near Nogales, Arizona. This is the same thing that they still want to do here in Roma, Rio Grande City, and Los Evanos. There are still 14 miles of proposed wall on the book that would go in Roma, Rio Grande City, Los Evanos. In the Rio Grande floodplain, uh, in violation of our international treaty with Mexico. And they say, these things will be fine. The water's gonna pass right through them, no problem. The track record's not very good on that one. Now, you also, of course, have a lot of the social issues that come with the wall. This is in Brownsville. Uh, this is on kind of the east side of Brownsville. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's bad enough when you have environmental damage kind of out in the sticks. It's bad enough when you scare people out in the sticks. 
I cannot imagine what it must be like for the kids living in those houses, literally in the shadow of the border wall. You know, my daughter was pretty terrified by a half an hour of these two guys with machine guns. I cannot imagine what it's like to have this every single day of your life growing up. But this is what some people want to have more of. And the last point, well, one of the last points to make is that these walls don't make sense, right? This is not a situation where you have this great idea and some people have to pay the cost, but you know it, it helps everybody else. The nation is a, is a safer place because of these walls are up. The walls don't work. They are not, they don't make sense. Um, you know, you have walls, especially in South Texas, that start and stop and start and stop, you know. A couple miles here, a few miles of nothing, a couple more miles, a few miles of nothing. Uh, you know, here in South Texas, we have 54 miles of border wall, but they're broken into 19 mostly unconnected sections. This is the end of the wall. You know, our wall doesn't go into the ocean. It stops in the middle of some guy's farm field. Um, you know, before it does that, there's people who, you know, it goes through Brownsville, it goes through citrus orchards, it goes through <coughs> Nature Conservancy and U.S. Fish and Wildlife lands, and then it just stops. So I guess like the rest of the border is for that tractor to protect. Um, you know, it, it makes no sense, but it really wasn't supposed to. The wall is a political imperative. The wall was built because Congress passed the Secure Fence Act in, in 2006. They said, we want to see X number of miles built by December of 2008. Don't care where you put them. It's just a mile count. Do it. And so each sector was given their mile count. They saluted. They said, you know, here's where we'll stick them. Nobody ever paid any attention to whether it did anything or not. And it really didn't. This is a pretty old section of wall in Naco, Arizona. Um, if you look, there and there and there and there and there, it's not a very long section. It's five holes that have been patched in that one small section. Uh, in this stretch, there are those kind of patches that just go and go and go and go and go for the entire length of the thing. So, this thing is so well defended that a guy can sit there with a welding torch or cutting torch and power a hole through it and still get through and still get a weld. <coughs> they don't work. Now, in this this kind of um, and this is our wall again. <laughs> I totally, I didn't stage that at all, I swear to you. The, the Border Patrol is guys who can stack those ladders up top for me. Um, this is in Chicago again. So, this is South Texas. If you don't feel like going around and you don't have a, a cutting torch on you, you go and spend two bucks on, on hardware and you build a ladder. Um, you know, at Hidalgo, anytime you go, there's usually a stack of ladders. And sometimes they get big and then the, the guys from the county cart them off and then they then gets piled up again. You know, Border Patrol doesn't want to leave the ladder sitting against the wall. They want to make the guy have to carry the next ladder over and do a little bit of work for it. Um, but the ladders keep coming. And they're all kind of the same design, so I think there's like one guy with a shop in Reno. Um, but they don't, but you know, if, if it wasn't working, the guy with the ladder shop in Reno would go out of business. And, you know, the, the current situation right now with refugee children, the children that are coming over from Honduras, from Guatemala, uh, from El Salvador, the walls don't do anything on that. You know, these kids are typically turning themselves in as soon as they get across the border. But, you know, the rest of the country and a lot of politicians are all freaked out about this. And they say, we have to put our boots on the ground, send in the National Guard. You know, these kids are turning themselves in. They're not a security threat, uh, and they're not trying to get away from anybody. So, you know, this is, that's up against the wall there, again, in Hidalgo. That's the concrete of the wall behind it. Um, it doesn't make sense. The response doesn't make sense. We're paying, you know, we're having all of these impacts occur. 
uh, both environmental and social, for something that does not make sense and does not in any way address the situation at hand. If you look at apprehensions of non-minors, you know, the number of minors getting, getting picked up has gone way up in the last couple of years because they're trying to escape from horrific violence. But if you look at overall numbers, apprehension rates are right about where they were in 1974, 1975, before we had all, before we had huge numbers of border patrol. It's, it's just ludicrous. So these are old maps, but they're, they're still pretty good. And they're, as far as locations, they're pretty accurate. And you know the, the big one here, like the, the, the graphs, kind of, you can ignore. I mean, you can pay attention to them, but they're pretty old. Um, but red line, that's our walls, except whoops, uh, Roma, Rio Grande City, and Los Sevenos. Those are the three that they haven't built yet that, that they really want to build. The other one up in the top is a New York Times map from, I think, 2007, something like that. And it shows where all the walls were going to be built uh, border wide. And the thing to pay attention to is two aspects of this. First off, if you look up at kind of everything from El Paso over, that's pretty much all walls. And where you see a gap, there's a mountain. If you look at Texas, there's hardly any wall. And if you look at the Rio Grande Valley, there's a whole bunch of gaps. So right now, you have members of Congress who say, there is this crisis on the border. We need more boots on the ground. We need more walls. And you get, on the one hand, some of the members of the House that want to build walls, but they've actually passed a couple of times bills that would expand the waiving of laws. And I mentioned before, they would waive every federal law for anything the Border Patrol felt like doing within 100 miles of the border instead of right up against the border. That's actually passed the House a couple of times in the last couple of years. It just never makes it anywhere in the Senate. The Senate side, you have comprehensive immigration reform, which kind of is a general idea, is a great thing. But unfortunately, the Senate version says, you know, the 13-year pathway to citizenship that will be granted to people, they won't start on that 13-year pathway to citizenship until we build a couple hundred more miles of border wall. Um, they haven't finished building at least these three sections, you know, around Rio Grande City, those were from the 2006 bill. So if they couldn't get those built from 2006 till now, imagine what's gonna happen if they have to build a couple hundred miles of border wall, and they're doing it in here, and they've already taken most of the federal refuge lands they could. So this is mostly going to be, not all, because you can see the green is refuge, but a lot of private property. You know, there are still uh, condemnation lawsuits that are in court today from the 2006 bill. So immigration reform is a great thing. The Sierra Club uh, has come out you know, officially in favor of a pathway to citizenship, but not in favor of more walls and waivers. And if you make the pathway to citizenship contingent on building walls first, which is what the Senate bill did, you're not actually ever gonna get that pathway to citizenship because it's gonna be a decade at a minimum before those walls are built. And in the process, you're gonna do a huge amount of damage to <coughs> communities, wildlife refuges, uh, and the environment as a whole. So, that's all I got. Maria Cordero, my name is Jose Dominguez. I'll be translating for Maria today. 
Uh, she's a community organizer with the ACLU of Texas, who's part of the Equal Voice Network, and today we want to share with you our reality uh, in this world. La región fronteriza es hogar de casi 1.2 millones de personas en el Valle del Rio Grande, que diariamente interactúan con CBP, patrulla fronteriza, DPS o policías locales, cuando ellos van en camino al trabajo, al supermercado o a hacer sus mandados. Desafortunadamente, en los últimos años, nuestras colonias han notado un incremento en agentes federales y en los últimos meses y semanas de policías estatales y hasta la Guardia Nacional. Ninguno de ellos con suficiente supervisión de sus actos. The border region is home to 1.2 million people in the Rio Grande Valley who encounter CBP and Border Patrol daily to go to work, buy groceries, or run basic errands. Unfortunately, our colonias have experienced an increase of federal agents in the last federal agents, and in the last couple of months and weeks, state troopers and even the National Guard. None of them with adequate oversight and accountability. Nuestra frontera ha sido testigo del gasto excesivo y necesario de recursos para contratar más agentes de patrulla fronteriza, para tener más drones, para tener más muros, y ahora nuestro gobierno estatal gasta una fortuna al mandar agentes estatales y a la Guardia Nacional para vigilar nuestra frontera. Our border has witnessed an unnecessary and excessive expense of border enforcement resources for more border patrol agents, more drones, more border walls, and now even our state government spends a fortune by sending state troopers and the National Guard to secure our borders. Tristemente, esto lleva a una serie de problemas, tales como, imaginen lo siguiente, vehículo confiscado, dos mil dólares, días de trabajo perdidos, cinco mil cuatrocientos dólares, abogado, mil seiscientos dólares, multa con inmigración, tres mil dólares, préstamos para pagar la renta por tres meses, mil doscientos dólares, total, trece mil doscientos dólares. Ese es el costo de la militarización, es el costo de la colaboración entre las autoridades locales con inmigración. Esta es la historia de un hombre que fue detenido por la patrulla fronteriza después de que la policía local lo detuviera por una infracción de tránsito y llamara a la migración. Él dejó atrás a su esposa y a un bebé recién nacido y a un niño en edad preescolar. Ella, sin trabajo, sin vehículo y sin sustento, tuvo que empezar a trabajar para darle de comer a sus hijos. Sadly, all this leads to a series of problems. In economic impact, impounded vehicle to thousand dollars, work days lost, uh, five thousand, five, five, all right, five thousand four hundred dollars, attorney, sixteen hundred dollars, immigration bond, three thousand dollars. Loans to pay rent for three months, $1,200. Total, $13,200. This is the cost of militarization, of the collaboration between local law enforcement agencies and the Border Patrol. This is the story of a man who was apprehended by Border Patrol after lo local cops stopped him for a traffic violation and then called Border Patrol. He left his wife, his newborn baby, and a toddler behind. She didn't have a job, nor a car, and no support, so she had to start working in order to keep her kids. Ahora les voy a dar un ejemplo del impacto emocional. Una pareja iba caminando a recoger a su hijo a la parada del autobús escolar. La patrulla fronteriza los detiene y les pide sus documentos. La pareja le dice que no tiene papeles y patrulla fronteriza les dice que se los tiene que llevar. Ellos les explican que tienen que recoger a su hijo que no lo pueden dejar solo. Entonces el oficial deja ir a la madre y se lleva al padre, quien posteriormente es deportado. El niño ahora tiene miedo de que su mamá salga a la calle. Teme que un día nunca regrese porque la agarre migración y la deporten a México. Ese es el temor de un niño ciudadano americano. An example of the emotional impact. Um, a couple was walking towards the school bus stop to pick up their child when they were randomly stopped and questioned by Border Patrol. The couple didn't have legal status, therefore Border Patrol tells them they have to be, they have to be apprehended. 
They explain to the agent that they can't leave, that they have to wait for their child to arrive, that they can't live him alone. The border patrol agents then allow the mother to stay, but they tell them that they have to take the father into custody. He was later deported. Their child is now afraid that his mother might be apprehended and deported too. He's scared that one day she'll run an errand and she might never come back home because Border Patrol might get her and deport her back to Mexico too. This is a fear of a child. This is a fear of a U.S. citizen child. Impacto en la relación con nuestras autoridades. A una ciudadana estadounidense, un policía local le marca el alto. Durante el cuestionamiento, el policía le pregunta a la señora sobre su estado migratorio. Ella le dice que es ciudadana americana. El policía no le cree y le pide una prueba. La señora tuvo que manejar hasta su casa y mostrarle su pasaporte al policía local para que la dejara ir. Ella, por miedo a represalias, se negó a denunciar este incidente. The impact of the militarization in the relationship with law enforcement. The U.S. citizen was stopped by a local cop. During the questioning, the cop inquired about her immigration status. She tells him she's a U.S. citizen, but the cop doesn't believe her, and he asks for proof. She has to drive all the way to her house to show her to show the cop the passport, so he could let her go. She fears retaliation, therefore that's the reason that she doesn't want to report the abuse. Si bien entendemos que el trabajo que tienen los agentes federales y la policía local y estatal es difícil y con riesgos, también es necesario que ellos entiendan las preocupaciones y temores de nuestra comunidad. En la región fronteriza existen familias de estados mixtos, padres con documentos con hijos ciudadanos, residentes y ciudadanos sin estatus, etc. Es por eso que la relación entre las agencias del orden público y la comunidad debe de ser transparente, de confianza y de mutua colaboración. Yo personalmente como organizadora comunitaria, ¿cómo puedo enseñarle yo a, las, a, a, a la comunidad que la prioridad de nuestras policías locales es proteger a nuestra comunidad cuando sus historias personales demuestran todo lo contrario? Just like we understand that law enforcement agents have a tough and risky job, it is necessary, <coughs> it is necessary that they understand the community's fears and concerns. In this border region, we have mixed status families. They're very common. Undocumented parents with U.S. citizen children, residents and citizens, people with no status. And it's because of that reason that the relationship between law enforcement agencies and the community has to be transparent, reliable, and a mutual collaboration. Personally, as a community organizer, how can I teach the community that the priority of our, our law enforcement agencies is to protect our communities when their personal stories with those agencies are the opposite. Para las comunidades en nuestra frontera, lo principal es nuestra seguridad y la de nuestras familias. Necesitamos revitalizar nuestras comunidades en lugar de militarizarla. Necesitamos que autoridades locales, estatales y federales se enfoquen en mejorar nuestra calidad de vida, de educación, de salud y de vivienda. Nuestra comunidad está pagando muy alto la, la militarización en nuestra región. For our border communities, our family safety is the most important thing. We need to revitalize our communities instead of militarizing them. We need for local, state, and federal authorities to focus on improving our quality of life, education, health, and housing. Our communities are paying a very high price because of the militarization of our region. La frontera es más que una línea divisoria y punto importante entre dos países. Este lugar es nuestro hogar y nosotros antes que nadie queremos vivir en un lugar seguro, queremos tener una frontera segura. Tristemente no nos sentimos así y el motivo no es por el aumento del crimen en nuestras comunidades como muchos dicen, sino porque no nos sentimos protegidos por las agencias del orden público que han jurado defender su nación y a todos los residentes que habitamos aquí. The border is more than a line, and it's more than a line and an important port of entry between two countries. These places are home, and above all, we want to live in a safe place. We want to have a secure border. Sadly, we don't feel that way, and the reason is not because crime has increased, like many people say. 
It's because we don't feel secure nor protected by law enforcement agencies that have sworn to protect our nation and all the residents who live in this region too. Gracias. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to the candidates.